Hey everyone, welcome to the next episode of Building It Up with Bertelsmann, India's first podcast that focuses on the growth stories of a startup. I am your host Ankur Variku and with me today is someone who's known for transforming companies into iconic brands that we interact with on a daily basis. A graduate from Stanford and Harvard, she has over 20 years of experience building brands and consumer perception, advising executive management, scaling operational teams and developing global success stories. Some of the companies that she's consulted over the years, Netflix, Google Ventures, Walmart, Udacity, Khan Academy, Zynga, just naming a few. It's my absolute pleasure to be speaking to Sharnaz Davar today. Sharnaz is an executive advisor with Google Ventures and in this episode of Building It Up with Bertelsmann, we'll be speaking on how to use storytelling in startups. narratives that can work seamlessly and consistently to all stakeholders and how geography impacts communications and much more thank you so much anas for joining all the way from silicon valley i know it's late for you in the day but it's a pleasure that you could make time for us thank you anku for having me on you've spent a whole lot of time working very closely with the finest brands that we get to see and hear of every day and worked with them on the art of communication on the art of internal and external communication on the art of storytelling and and that i am personally very passionate about i'm a firm believer in storytelling and i see that in most indian startups particularly it's not given as much importance as we think it should deserve um in my opinion the the emphasis on building brands right from get go is is not something that is a clear focus from day one while i think it should be so what we'd love to do is spend time with you in trying to figure out what is it that founders should look out for right from day one uh, are there elements that uh, they should keep in mind uh, your experience across geographies will be really helpful um so let me begin with asking you a fundamental question which mm-hmm. which will be more of a start um, how important do you think thinking about the story behind the brand is important from day one itself so i think it's a part of it is if you're starting a company and let's say you're two guys in a garage or you're two women or a woman and a guy whatever the two or three founders are mm-hmm. they have a core belief for why they're starting the company and they have a narrative behind that So I feel any successful company you can look across the board in technology has started with a founder having a deep belief in something that he or she wants to change. And so from that comes the story that helps a company if it can kind of transcend through the years and grow with it. So I feel it's a critical part. I don't feel it's a part that says, "Okay, I'm starting a company today in the e-commerce space. Let me figure out what my story is." <laughs> I don't think you need that. I think what you do need in the early days is like you said, kind of all the blocking and tackling. What's the product market fit? Where do I get my funding from? Where do I get my first employees from? Hmm. But as you go through the journey, you will find that you're telling a story about the company without even knowing it. you're telling it to the investors you're telling it to customers you're telling it to your employees and that kind of becomes a critical part of the journey in creating a company so whether you're talking about it explicitly or not it's always there you just have to suss it out in a way to make sure it stays to be an important component of the company got it and and would your advice be to founders that they should think of this objectively and consciously and document it or is that something that comes more as a realization as they move along um you know i'm always reminded of this director verna herzog mm-hmm. who based on some phenomenal movies and he did a movie where he got to go into these french caves that were 300 something 35000 years old and nobody's actually been able to go in and photograph them it's called the cave of my dreams i think the documentary and he actually saw paintings of cave uh, of our ancestors doing stories hmm. and they were of war stories of birth and they were depicting them over the years hmm. so we inherently on core as human beings are storytellers yeah and i feel that if a company can have a base which is the culture of the company that is based on some story or narrative of why am i here 
Why am I creating a company that's going to change the way we shop? Why am I creating a company that's going to change the way I drive? Mm. That matters a lot. I don't feel it needs to be documented, per se, in the early days. I think once you get to be the size of a Google or a Facebook, sure, feel free to document it. Mm -hmm. But when you're going through the startup, the C, the A, the B, the C, there should be a story that's narrated and told to people that becomes a critical part of the company. I so agree with that. I, as, as founders, we, we're very guilty of consuming ourselves with the what and the how and not so much focusing on the why of it. And I, I go back to my favorite TED talk of Simon Sinek who says people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Uh, And I couldn't agree more with you there. Uh, And that's what we always forget. And, you know, I'll tell you one thing that at least we're seeing here. I don't know if that's happening in India too, but I would assume it is, Uh, is there's a war for talent. Yeah. Uh, You know, good developers, good product designers, good marketers, good finance people uh, who tend to be at the cream of the crop are being hunted by every company. And at the end of the day, the way to win them over, the really talented people, is to give them a reason for why am I here? And am I going to be able to do something that will make a difference? And I think that's where a whole lot of the why comes in. I agree. That that leads me to my, my next question. Do you see that the first beneficiaries of this why are usually internal stakeholders, meaning the employees, or is it largely geared towards the external audience? I'm a big believer on hiring. I feel that any company is actually a collection of people. And if the people all disappear, the company disappears. Yeah. And I think a lot of CEOs and particularly founders often fall into the trap of saying, my key audience is my shareholders or my key audience is my customers and don't pay much attention to the internal employees Mm -hmm. Um, because I think sometimes we take them for granted. And I think we need to reverse our thinking to say that is my most important stakeholder and if I am going to create a narrative, the way I would do it is first to them. So I do a ton of work with different companies and a lot of work externally. And the audience I am the most nervous Mm. about speaking to is actually the internal employees (laughs) because they are your harshest critics and they are your most valued stakeholder because if they walk out the door, a lot of your knowledge and a lot of your ability to execute to get to the next level as a company walks out too. I so agree with you and I'm glad you're making that statement. The internal stakeholders are the ones that are your biggest critics and if they walk out they're walking out with pretty much everything that you've done together wonderful um one particular challenge that i see more so in india is a a lot of startup shenas are being started by people from an engineering background and uh, i don't i don't mean to stereotype but not my words according to them they're better problem solvers than communicators Uh, Mm -hmm. It's natural for them to be spending time coding, working with math, getting people driven in specific problems and the solutions rather than spending time in storytelling. Um, One, I'm sure that that's the same thing that happens in the U.S. as well. So what's Mm -hmm. been your experience around that? And two, what would be your advice as someone who's done this for so many years to a founder who thinks that he or she is a better problem solver than a communicator and this is not their natural style of leadership or of even living life? Yeah, that's a really good question and we actually do face that a lot. Um, there's, I'm reminded of this great book called Quiet, which I highly recommend everybody read. Yeah. And it's about pretty much what you're talking about. There are so many founders and people, especially in technology, that are actually technologists and tend to be on the quieter side. Mm. They don't advocate for themselves. They're not good communicators. And the whole book talks about how not to ignore these people, assuming they're not the founder, and what you do about it. And I highly recommend it. The way I look at it is you don't have to be a terrific communicator. But I do feel that if you are the founder and you want people to follow you, you need to have the ability to communicate with them in some way. If you're more of an introvert and it's much better for you to go and drink beers at a pub, do that. That's okay. If you feel it's better for you to kind of be breaking, writing code with somebody at 11 p.m. at night or doing a hackathon, do that. 
communication doesn't have to be that you have to stand up in front of an audience and constantly talk. It can be any kind of way of communicating, but the idea is you're the founder and you really care about the employees and you're with them. I think that's the most important thing. Ultimately, when you become a big company and you don't want to talk to the public, you'll probably hire a COO or another CEO or a CFO, and they'll do all the community and all the talking. But the founders will probably be the people that everyone has a really special place in their heart for because you're the one sitting with them doing their code, listening and problem solving for them, which you're really good at, Mm. and being able to give them the leeway to do what they would want to do. Wonderful. Great. So... What, what you're suggesting, and I so agree with that, is that it's not so much the direct communication that determines what the story is, but also the softer signals that are sent out, whether it's through initiatives in the company, policies that are drafted, the way you draft your emails, the way you treat your employees, and so on. Because at the end of it, your internal stakeholders need to recognize how they feel about what is it that you're saying, not so much what is it that you say in words. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those where often actions speak louder than words. Yeah. There are a lot of CEOs in the Valley that speak a lot louder than their actions attest to, and I think you probably want to go with someone who acts much better than just speaks. Okay. If you're comfortable sharing, um, is there someone that comes to your mind globally who does a commendable job of this? Uh, of being a leader? Of being uh, a leader and an effective storyteller, while it may not be their natural self? Uh, you know, it's it's hard. So uh, I used to work with Reed Hastings at Netflix. Yeah. And Reed comes actually from an engineering background. Yeah. So, you know, and a math back Actually, he comes from a math background. And he is a very effective communicator mm. on both levels. Effective in the way over the years of talking to large audiences, mm. but also in the early days, which is when I was at Netflix, effective yeah. in talking to small groups and sitting and doing things with them. Mm. So I feel that there are lots of ways that you can do this and you know the best thing to think about it is the best leaders are not anointed they actually (laughs) have earned the right to be the leader and if you've earned the trust of your employees whichever way you do it they're going to follow you and you're going to build a great company wonderful that's so true um you you talk about Consistency of the story, Shana, is a, a lot, and I've I, I came across various forums and interventions where you spoke about being consistent with the story. Um, what do you think is the importance of sticking to a story as against changing it because you feel that the market conditions or maybe your own personal motives have changed? Uh, is that something yeah. that you encounter and does well eventually or not? Uh, I do find that businesses, you know, when they go from any company that starts with its seed financing and is continuing to do the same business once it gets to becoming an IPO is pretty rare. I don't actually think I know of many companies like that mm. because I think along the way, your ideas have to morph and evolve because then you are kind of a living, breathing company overall. But the core of why you started it doesn't change that much. So as long as the core stays, it definitely helps the company grow. Take Amazon, for example, which may or may not be a good idea based on the climate in India right now. (laughs) But when Jeff started the company, it was going to be, I'm going to sell books online. Then he expanded it to sell everything online and added, you know, vendors and third parties and publishing and all of the things. But the core idea of the ability to buy a book online never changed. Uh, it just kind of got added or morphed to, and, you know, Amazon is a juggernaut now. Yeah. I want to shift focus, Shanaz, on um, on things that founders possibly don't want to prepare themselves for or think that it may not happen to them, but every startup or every such setup does go through its pains and pangs, which are around the sensitive situations, uh, downsiding, buyouts, uh, investors exiting, leaders or leadership team exiting, so on. Um, Is there something that can prepare founders for such situations? How should they look at these situations where it's required for them to be absolutely at their best, if I may say so, and yet it would not be the easiest for anyone to pull off? Yeah, so this happens a lot, and I will tell founders at any stage, if you are going to have your first crisis, it could be anything, to your point. It could be an investment, it could be a buyout. 
you know, it could be embezzlement. It could be a lot of things, but you're going to be hit with it. You have to know that. And I generally say three things. Number one is the founder needs to acknowledge something happened. And I, to be honest, that is the hardest thing <laughs> because founders have a really difficult time acknowledging something bad might have happened because it's a tendency of a founder to be optimistic. You are supposed to have irrational optimism to be a startup founder, as you well know. Um, and I think that's really important. Number two is actually to move fast. So I've been in lots of situations where we've hit a crisis. And the best way we've done it is to kind of come into a room, literally like a war room, the key holders, and say, okay, what are we going to do about it? Let's acknowledge the problem. Let's figure out what we're going to do about it. And then the third thing is communicate the course of action quickly. But first, communicate it to your internal stakeholders. Just like we talked about earlier, your employees are the most important. Very often what happens is in our haste to kind of get a message out to the media on something, we'll tell the media before we tell the employees. And that's a misfire yeah. because an employee should hear what their founder or CEO is doing before somebody else hears it or there's a tweet put out. Hmm. So I feel like if you can acknowledge, move fast, and communicate your change in direction, you're going to do much better and you're going to be respected for it. Hmm. It's often things that you might have self-inflicted. Uh, for example, you might have had a bad partnership. You might have reported revenues that were not accurate. It might be your fault, in fact, and the best thing to do is to acknowledge it and apologize. It's the best thing to do, but it's the hardest thing to do. And once you can get over that hump, I think the rest of it becomes a lot easier. It's extremely valuable advice, and I think being being honest and being comfortable with vulnerability is, is perhaps the hardest thing for a founder to get used to, but I couldn't agree more that it's, it's the necessary step for being a effective and honest communicator. Um, one thing that I've always wondered about, and you, you may choose to have a disagreement on this, I, I've always thought that founders in their own setup should think of themselves as almost celebrities in the sense that Whatever is it that they say, how they conduct themselves, how they deal with people is always looked at and scrutinized much more than they expect them to be. So there's this balance that founders are trying to strike, which is being themselves, which could be an absolute reflection of who they are. But possibly in that mode, they may end up doing things or saying things that they shouldn't or being, quote unquote, politically correct, which is sensing the fact that they have a social responsibility or a public responsibility towards conducting themselves in the right manner. Do you have a view on this? Yeah, actually, I don't. I think in many ways you're right. I don't think founders should see themselves as celebrities. I do think they should see themselves as being, at a, as being perceived as being at a different level than anyone else hmm. uh, overall. And so let me explain what I mean. If you are a founder and you become the CEO, that's one path. Very often, you can be an early employee and for various reasons suddenly ascend to becoming CEO very quickly. Once you're the found CEO, which is kind of the top job for a better, lack of a better way to do this, it becomes very lonely because you generally will surround yourself with people that might agree with you. So mm -hmm. suddenly you get a lot of yes men and yes women around you. So there's nobody that can actually tell you the truth and say, look, what you're doing, Uncle, doesn't make sense at all. It's going to hurt us. And so I think when you're the CEO, it's a very, very lonely job because there aren't that many people that you can confide to where your failings might be and things of that nature. Another thing that we tend to do, and I think I see this in India too a lot, um, you know, as well as actually in Europe and China, is we put founders on a pedestal. <laughs> um, some of it, you know, might be slightly deserved. They're the ones who had the idea. They're the ones that were eating the ramen noodle on and, you know, working 24-7. Uh, but once you do that, then very often they can do no wrong, and that becomes really difficult too. And then it feeds on itself because the founder very often will just listen to all the hype and hubris around them 
and realize, wow, I'm pretty invincible. <laughs> Um, you know, until something like a crisis happens and then it either comes crashing down or when the crisis happens, they go, I'm not going to acknowledge it because I'm invincible. So, true. so somebody once told me this, and it's a really good piece of advice, basically said, if you look at it as it's never as good as it gets or as bad as it seems, <laughs> you will be able to succeed. So the idea is don't believe all the media hype that's written about you as a founder. Yeah. And when you get creamed by something, you know, left off center, it's going to go away. The sun is going to rise the next day. It's going to be better and you're going to make it better. And that gives you kind of, you know, the humility and the respect mm. to become an effective leader. That's solid advice. Thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, w- one thing that's happening in India a lot, Shanaz, is, uh, and I reckon not so much in the West, is because the startup community and the entire ecosystem is still extremely young, uh, there is this fascination about the press. If you get written about in daily newspapers or get spoken about in the media journals, you have arrived. And I see a lot of founders in general just spending an inordinate amount of their time and energy in chasing those dreams while admitting that to some extent it does help in creating a persona of the brand and the startup. What would be your advice in how to devote time between chasing the press or the external media as against just sticking to your story and then allowing them to chase you thereafter? I'd say it's a balance. So if you and I were sitting next to one another, I would tell you this. I'm going to just kind of have us imagine it. I look at every company taking out marketing brand, just any company, Hmm. and I look at two circles. There's a reality circle and a perception circle. Hmm. And if you can imagine, the perception circle overlaps a little bit of the reality circle, like a Venn diagram, and the perception circle is a little bit bigger than the reality circle. Hmm. And the reality is everything you do with your company, the customers you get, your finances, your product, your sales. And your perception is what the world thinks of you. Mm. And generally, perception should be a little bit bigger than reality because we as humans buy into a vision. When you are buying stock on the Indian Stock Exchange, you're buying Tata Steel or you're buying, uh, you know, Mitesh Ambani stock, you're buying it on the vision that Mm. Reliance will go up or Mm. TCS will go up. Mm. Uh, But when that reality becomes really tiny and the perception becomes huge, that kind of happens when you're chasing the media a whole lot, chances are the company's not going to succeed. So a very vivid example of this right now is Theranos, which is, um, you know, a company that was started in Silicon Valley, uh, taking a lot of investment funding, was on the cover of almost every magazine known to man, and it crumbled. It's right now, you know, under SEC regulations, under criminal investigations. So the perception got too big. And then very often the reality could be really big and the perception is tiny. And this will often happen in companies in the healthcare and life sciences area Mm. because media generally doesn't really like covering cancer and diabetes and Alzheimer's. But companies are doing incredible work in the area. Mm. It's just that people don't know about them as much as they know about the next social media company or the transportation company. So if you look at the two circles and can balance them such that reality is a little smaller than perception, but it is in proportion, you're on your way to having a good company. Hmm. Having said this, this is what I tell founders when they ask me about the media, and I say particularly in India because India is so has so much print proliferation, yeah. is, you know, today's Times of India is tomorrow's fish wrap. <laughs> As long as you know that, you can see what's going to happen to you. <laughs> All right, let, let, let's shift gears, Shanaz. Uh, what you come with is tremendous knowledge of having worked with brands that span across geographies. And uh, I'd love to understand a little bit about what is it that you see are similarities or differences between the Western way of building startups, which is largely the value or the US, if you will, and then your experience of having worked really closely with Audacity, which is a Bertelsmann venture, uh, helping set up their India business. And you would have seen different set of challenges in communication, storytelling, brand building. Yeah, so I'll do it with India and the US. I think it might be easier uh, and particularly relevant to the audience. Um, So I actually 
have done both. So I actually have worked most of my life in the U.S., but I also spent time in Europe and Asia building operations. So mm-hmm. I see it from both sides of it. Mm-hmm. Having had a U.S. boss both times, I was overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that I always tell U.S. companies is we will take, corporate will give you guidelines and will give you the core and the values of the company that you need to make sure you're communicating to your market. What you do in your local market is up to you because I will never profess to know India better than you would know it, Ankur. And I would never profess to know Germany better than a country manager in Germany would. Hmm. So I feel from that standpoint, the brand might stay the same, the story might stay the same, but it can get changed. You know, India for me, I love from a marketing standpoint, and I'll tell you why, largely because of the rich culture it has and the fact that it has all these different dialects, each of which have their own kind of corny jokes (laughs) that can kind of make way and be able to do really well in India. Um, Certain challenges we see, I, I can tell you firsthand that we saw with India and over here is India tends to be, and you can disagree with this totally, but it's my, uh, and happy to talk about it. India tends to be a very bright, colorful, noisy kind of culture. Yes. And very often when we have design firms here, they'll be kind of a little <laughs> bit more, I would say, staid, zen-like, you know, the perfect line and yeah. things like that. And that's not India. India yeah. is like holy, you know, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And that was a difference. So, you know, we did a commercial, I would say, for Udacity over here. And mm. then we, uh, our India office adapted it to India and did some other things with it. And it was good. Uh, for the Indian market. It Mm. would never have played over here. Mm. The beauty of doing it was the essence of what Udacity was about, which was all about lifelong learning and the aspiration to be something else, stayed intact. The execution was really different. Um, And I think that's kind of an important thing to look at. So when I hire my groups, I basically tell every local person It is your job to tell me what's best in that country, Mm. and we will give you kind of the so-called anchor with which to go forward. Google some years ago did this incredible commercial. Mm. I forget whether it was, it was some festival in India, Mm. and they were talking about, it was a story about a family that had been separated in India and Pakistan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you remember that? I remember that. It was on Google search and it was about these two friends that had separated during partition and their, one of their sons got them together through Google. Yeah. And I choked up when I watched <laughs> Yes. And, you know, my colleagues would never understand it. Yeah. But if you understood all of it and, you know, I forget who did it, but they nailed it. Absolutely. You know, and that's something that Google has done a lot of commercial sins, but very few commercials have had the impact that that commercial did. It was a moment in time. It was hitting the culture without being derogatory to any side of it. And it it just talked about humanity. Awesome. Um, Last two questions before we close. Um, Number one is when you um, when you think of Indian startups trying to create their business or expand their business in the U.S., um, by the same measure that you just described that what works in the U.S. does not work in India, what advice would you have for Indian founders who are looking to set up base or enter the U.S. market? Yeah, so, look, this is the way I see it. I think India had a huge you know, e-commerce boom when we had Flipkart and Snapdeal and all of these companies, and then it kind of went through a lull given everything going on. But now there's a lot of incredible startups coming from India. And part of the reason that we're seeing incredible ones come out of India is largely because of GEO, the 4G network that's giving people access to smartphones at like zero to no cost. And so on top of that, there are these great startups that are being built. You know, there's a company called Data that allows you to have news and sports feed on top of WhatsApp. We would never have that here. That makes (laughs) sense much sense in India. Mm. You know, there are companies that are doing offline retail with online. Um, There are a few companies that there's a venture outfit out of Silicon Valley called Rocket Ship. They're very familiar with the India market, and they've done a lot of these investments, um, you know, overall. The other thing that I love about Indian startups is 
you know, there are certain areas that we were already in offline. So rentals is a perfect example. Hmm. You know, if you live in the U.S., you can rent an apartment, you can rent a house. The Indian market for rental properties has never really existed. You True. either bought a home or you lived with your parents or, you know, whatever. That was what it was. It was hard, you, never, you hardly ever rented. Now, with basically online, there are rental companies coming online, and they have none of the legacy or the baggage that we have over here. It's almost like they're leapfrogging an entire generation of business <laughs> and coming out on the other side. And those are exciting things for India. So very often when Indian companies ask me, I often tell them, you may not want to come to the U.S. The U.S. market is highly costly, it's high marketing, and it's very saturated. Yeah. If you are doing really well in India from a customer base and you want to expand, then expand into Southeast Asia. Hmm. Look at Vietnam, look at Singapore, look at Indonesia. And then once you reach a certain level of revenue, of track record, and you really have customers in, uh, in the U.S., then set up an operation here. So Freshdesk is a perfect example. They're out of Chennai, yeah. and they basically, you know, have set up an operation in the U.S., but after a fair amount of time and having tremendous success in India, you know, in other countries as well. True. I was talking to a founder today out of Europe, and he's looking at expanding, and he's also looking at first expanding into Asia because it's a market that's a little bit closer, and there is a fair amount of demand for his product. So I don't think you should fall for the idea that you become more important or you're on page six because you've moved your operation to the U.S. <laughs> I think there's an unbelievably vibrant and rich community of customers and employees in India and Asia, and i probably expand there first, then kind of taking the lead to the U.S. Couldn't agree more with you. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Shanaz, this is all that we have for, for right now. So thank you, Shanaz. This has been a wonderful conversation. We, we couldn't have expected a better outcome. This was extremely useful, and I'm sure that our listeners will appreciate a lot and take away a lot from that. Great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely a pleasure. And with that, we come to yet another episode closure of Building It Up with Bertelsmann. Sharnaz was an absolute revelation when it came to storytelling and the fine art of communication and the importance of it while building a startup. In the next episode, we will speak to yet another distinguished individual from the startup community, picking up their brains on what it is to grow a startup in the Indian ecosystem. Until then, this is Ankur Variku saying goodbye. Don't forget to subscribe to Building It Up with Bertelsmann and wish you all a pretty good day. 